our speaker tonight, the one, the only Richard Burt, whom we have had the pleasure of listening to and learning from for the past couple years, I think, right? Yeah, four years. And he does know more than turquoise. You know, let us let us be sure about that. Now, turquoise is a great part of it, but so are a lot of areas around Orange County. Orange County, uh, I mean, Orange, excuse me, um, California, basically. And yeah. you're a native born Californian who grew up and, 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 and did these things anyway. When you were growing up, you were out there yep. whacking at rocks and hunting them and, and doing things with them. So he comes from a long history of that in the San Gabriel Mountains. You know, so I, um, I don't know if there's anything else that they need to know about you. You can always ask questions in the chat, you know, or Richard will be available at the end to answer any of your questions. You know, you can write them down as you go. And as you write them down, maybe they will be answered by stuff coming up. You never know. So I will turn this over to you, our vice president of this uh, chapter of the South Course, South Orange County Gem and Mineral Society. It's the letrozole. That's what's messing with my brain. Thank you. Uh, so uh, everybody, uh, I, I take great pride in the fact that um, I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley and I grew up under the shadow in particular of Mount Baldy. So my playground growing up was the San Gabriel uh, Mountains. And I, I used to fish there to Elaine's uh, uh, credit. I used to spend a lot of time visiting the old historic gold mines. Uh, I used to go and rock hound in the San Gabriels. And uh, so this is very near and dear to me. Um, in 1976, I attended um, Citrus Junior College in Azusa. And I studied under a gentleman by the name of Dr. D. Trent, who was the foremost expert on uh, plate tectonics in the formation and creation of uh, the San Gabriel Mountains and the, the knowledge of the fault systems in um, uh, LA Basin. And so this trip that I'm gonna describe here is something that I've actually been doing uh, with him since 1976. So it's very near and dear to me. Um, and the things that you're gonna see here, I think will be very mind blowing. This, the richness of the geology, richness of the history and just a very long and prestigious um, uh, uh, history of, of uh, mines. So I have a lot of historic photos that were part of uh, the D. Trent uh, uh, archive. He's still alive um, and God willing, when we do our field trip in May, uh, you'll see a 90 year old geologist who still has his heart in the mountains. So anyway, um, I often say that if there's one outcome I would prefer uh, that you guys experience off this presentation, as I often say, is gemstones are the gateway drug to geology. And uh, once you learn about gemstones and you get uh, enamored with them, then you want to find out how are they created, which brings the bigger question of what is geology. And then once you realize that every day you live around geology and then starting to understand the media uh, meaning and sequence of these things. So what I hope that you appreciate as I've broken it out into three sections today, we're gonna to talk about the very unique geology that we have here in Orange County. We're gonna talk a little bit about the LA Basin, and then we're gonna talk about all the beautiful things that have existed up in the San Gabriel Mountains around Mount Baldy. So with that in mind, um, I'm gonna just kind of move through slides and um, we're gonna uh, uh, stop for a question and answer at the end of this presentation. So feel free to, uh, using the chat function here, you can uh, leave questions or we can wait to this presentation's done. It should take about 45 minutes, I think, or less. So if we talk about provinces in Southern California, there's really uh, three uh, significant ones. Uh, one is that you have the LA Basin, which is pretty much the flat area between Orange County going all the way up to the San Gabriel Mountains. And what really defines the basin is that it's uh, home of 
several very known faults. So there's a fault system that runs through Santa Monica. There's a fault system that runs through Hollywood. There's the very famous Whittier uh, fault that uh, erupted in 1987. You have the Inglewood Newport fault. At the base of the mountains, you have the Cucamonga fault and you have the Raymond fault, which runs under Pasadena. But the key to remember about all of this is that this actual basin that we drive over on the freeways as we go around to LA and it seems very flat is the depth of the rock in the basin itself goes 23,000 feet deep. So they've done a lot of um, uh, seismic uh, studies and geological studies tied to oil drilling. And so we live in a very unique geology where the basin itself has very, very deep sedimentary layers augmented by these huge fault systems that are, are very deep underground. Um, some of them go as deep as seven miles. So uh, it's a very unique um, topography um, associated with these fault systems. And then if you go up, there's the, what we call the central transverse range, which is the San Gabriel Mountains. And those basically run from Cajon Pass in the east uh, to the Grapevine in the west. And these are very recent mountains, but what's interesting is that it's home to 10,000 feet uh, level peaks. We have, we have about seven peaks that are above 9,000 feet. So you have a tremendous amount of uplifting that's taken place in this area, uh, also tied to faults. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And then uh, from basically Palos Verdes all the way down to San Onofre, we have a very unique uh, coastal and offshore uh, geology where we have marine sediments that have been uplifted as blocks. And that would be things that you would see above Laguna and San Clemente and San Onofre and Palos Verdes. But the other thing is there's a lot of things that are going on geologically um, under the sea. So we have two huge deep sea canyons that um, go down 15,000 feet deep. So one is off of Newport, the other one is uh, off of uh, San Clemente. So, and these reach as far as the Channel Islands. So under the ground, if you were to just remove the water, uh, very, very steep canyon-like structures that are, that are these uh, sea canyons. The other thing that we have, which is really interesting is as the hillsides were basically pushed up uh, as part of this uplifted marine uh, sediments, is that they also eroded away. So one of the unique things that we see in San Clemente and Laguna and in Palos Verdes is these marine terraces where uh, the uplifted block has been slowly taken uh, down by erosion. And uh, so when you look at most of the subdivisions in San Pedro, Palos Verdes, Newport Coast, Laguna Beach, San Clemente, these were all built along these historic marine terraces. So when we talk about California, everybody talks about the San Andreas Fault, and that's just one story. So everybody should know that uh, based on, you know, geology is that uh, this area over here uh, is the Pacific Plate. And for a thousand miles along the San Andreas Fault, it's banged up against what was called the North American Plate. So we've had a, a very unique situation that for literally a thousand kilometers long, we've had the Pacific Plate uh, moving uh, east and the North American Plate holding its own. And what's happened is, is that we've had, instead of like one traverse fault, is we've had so many faults splinter under this tension. So this is a, a map that you can see here of just some of the major fault systems, but literally uh, west to east, it's 600 kilometers going all the way through central Nevada. So it doesn't just stop in California when we talk about these fault systems. 
So what is very unique about uh, Orange County and the San Gabriel Valley and LA is that it encompasses this entire squishy zone. Uh, and it also encounters uh, the San Andreas Fault. <laughs> so we have so much tectonic forces that make uh, uh, these mountains so complex. And literally, and I say this too, there's no other area in the world that has the geology that's defined by these fault systems like uh, Southern California, very unique geology. The other thing is, is that um, if you were to go up to San Francisco, there's some islands that are just off the Bay Bridge um, out to the west, and those are called the Farallon um, uh, Islands. So there's a section basically of the uh, uh, Pacific Plate that uh, is uh, they call the Farallon. It ran for about 70, uh, or, um, 70 miles, and then it eventually got to 300 miles, um, where it went underneath the North American Plate. And it dragged a lot of marine rock down into um, very deep, like maybe 25 to 50 miles down. It remelted and uh, it created a lot of rock formations that, that we now see on the surface. So not only when we're looking at these geo geological features defined by uh, faults, is that a lot of very old rock was created in a very shallow uh, subduction zone that now has been brought up through these other faults to the surface. So we see this really amazing rock that makes up 90% of Mount Baldy, it's called Polona Schist. And that was literally formed 10, 20 miles below the, the surface. So when we're talking about these types of processes, it's really important to understand that what really defines Southern California is that we're the host of probably the greatest formation of metamorphic rocks. And these were all created as a result of this fault stress. And we, we see these all the way out to the Channel Islands. There's a, a, a very beautiful blue uh, schist mineral called glaucophane. You can find that out in Catalina. And you go all the way inland to Mount Baldy, 90 miles away, and you find the same type of rock. So all of these little uh, fault zones have been moving around over time. So when we talk about these things, we really don't know what these faults looked like 10 million years ago, 90 million years ago. We just know that a lot of stuff got dragged along and brought up and brought down. So it's very, very uh, unique geology. If you look at the faults though, and what's interesting in this, if you had to uh, pick an epicenter, it would be Mount Baldy itself. And it's literally almost an island to itself. It has the San Andreas Fault on the very north of it. And then on the south side, you have the San Gabriel uh, Fault. And it's basically pushed itself up 10,000 feet. Uh, and it's not connected to any of the front range. Um, and what's interesting is, is that on the, this part of the San Andreas Fault, literally it's moving at two inches a year. So when they set out uh, 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 markers that they track via satellite now, um, it's moving at two inches a year um, just to the north of Mount Baldy. Um, What's interesting is the other thing that kind of defines the central transverse range is one that lies on the south end of the range that runs from Cucamonga through Laverne, through Glendora, through Sierra Madre is uh, called the Cucamonga Fault. It literally runs for 75 miles. So all of these uh, uh, fault systems that you see here uh, move, they cause stress, they break up the rock, they uplift. So it's a very rich and complex um, place. Just to talk about Orange County, we're not alone as well. Um, we have five major fault systems that surround us. 
So on the west is the uh, Inglewood Newport Fault. Um, this conveniently runs from basically the uh, SoFi Stadium and uh, uh, Forum all the way through Signal Hill and Long Beach, and then uh, uh, ends right about Balboa Peninsula. Um, Palos Verdes, there's a huge fault that runs along Manhattan Beach, but it goes out to sea and, and is off of the, uh, Huntington Beach. Um, you can pretty much uh, look at that as where all the oil rigs are. Um, we have a, a major fault that runs along the 73 toll highway uh, that's called the Shady Canyon uh, uh, Fault. And, um, and then we have uh, coming off the San Onofre uh, power station, we have a very powerful fault called the Capistrano Fault. So even in Orange County, where we like to think of it is that we're kind of removed from these faults. In reality, we are, we're surrounded by five of these. And what I love about faults in particular is that uh, humans are amazing our ability to put major infrastructure and expensive homes where we shouldn't really be building. <laughs> so, uh, so if you really look at the fault system, uh, we built uh, the, San, uh, the San Onofre power plant right on the Capistrano fault. Right. I'm glad that we're kind of deactivating that. Uh, we have three to... $24 million houses um, on liquefiable sand in Balboa Peninsula. Uh, we have major uh, real estate um, that runs through the uh, Palos Verdes Fault. Uh, and we also put all our, our gas and, um, and um, uh, petrol refining next to it. <laughs> And, you know, why, why wouldn't we want to, you know, build a toll highway that follows a fault line? <laughs> so the, the thing that's They're amazing, not even thinking. Yeah, so the amazing thing about all of this is that these zones are very, very known, but uh, we continue to kind of ignore them. When we look at uh, geological forces, um, in, in recent time, what's, what's interesting is that the actual tra traverse range, which we call the San Gabriels, is only 10 million years old. So imagine that the highest peak is 10,000 feet, Mount Baldy. Uh, the front range has Ontario and Cucamonga Peak, which are at 9,000. All of that has been uplifted in the last 10 million years. Um, probably the basin though, which is the, the most interesting thing, uh, was probably underwater. So while all these mountains that we're gonna talk about were being created, LA Basin was literally underwater. And uh, how we know this is because we have a huge amount of marine fossils that are found throughout the basin. So this little skull here, uh, which is the jaw of a megalodon shark, this was uh, found right on the surface in Laguna Hills. And you can go visit it. It's right next to a, uh, a coffee shop called High Tide. So this uh, shark lived between 12 million and 3 million years ago. So we know that uh, uh, this area was had to be underwater at this time that the San Gabriels were forming. Um, up on the toll highway, when they were uh, building it, they came across a very interesting pod of wells that they had never experienced before where they found literally 40 to 50 of them all stacked up. And it was a result of a volcanic uh, eruption where the ash basically covered them in their blowholes while they were swimming as a pod and they were all killed instantaneously and then settled into the sediment. So we have this very rich, um, history of marine fossils all throughout the LA basin that we don't see in any other places. And some of the, some of the best collectible places that you can go is a place called uh, Stoner Creek, which is in Roland Heights. It's a very famous place called Fossil Hill, where you can actually uh, retrieve uh, fully formed fish fossils out of chalk. Uh, Laguna Hills at the uh, community center 
has over a hundred examples of things that were found when they were excavating the, the soccer field. We also have a thing called Fossil Park. So um, all of this, you know, is part of the geological history of uh, LA and Orange County. So just sticking to Orange County, um, what's very important to realize is that almost everything associated with um, Orange County um, geology is a result of sedimentary processes. And at largely, if you look at all the rock formations that we have, it's usually some type of form of cemented sand or silt or cobblestones that have basically formed as sedimentary rocks. And then these were basically uh, part of the erosion history um, as the San Gabriels were being created and other uh, um, areas were forming, such as Saddleback Peak. We had these periods of uh, wetness and erosion. This stuff went all the way to the ocean and through the weight of it, it basically through its burial depth eventually became rock. So we can look at shells that have been cemented together. Um, they're very visible along this um, park in the Laguna Hills called Fossil Park. Um, if you look at almost all the beach bluffs in Laguna and um, Dana Point and S San Clemente and San Onofre, what you see as uh, these zones of, of uh, various levels of, of loose sediment that cemented together in different time sequences. And, the, and how you can determine them is the basic color and the basic kind of um, constituency that you see there. The other thing is to remember is that beaches are very active. So that you have a lot of erosion that's uh, occurring above the water level still. And then below you have a lot of uh, depositional erosion caused by waves that allows for sand and stuff to go into these submerged canyons and literally cascade down tens of thousands of feet. So we kind of view as the input for sand and these sediments currently is the Santa Ana River and the San Gabriel River. Those are very active every time it rains that brings a, a little bit more beach sand down. Um, we look at these submarine canyons as these outputs underwater. And then what's really important is to understand is the faults that we have on land continue um, out at sea. So we have as many uh, subterranean submersible, submerged faults than we have on land as well. And these are all can be very active. Um, so it's a very interesting geology that we live in here in Orange County. The most interesting thing though, that you probably have not noticed is that we have a lot of these, what I call marine terraces. So if uh, in this photo that you see here, I'm looking out towards main beach. And what you see is kind of this laddered approach to the hillsides. And what this represents is that um, at the very top, that's the oldest part of the uplifted area. And as it, as it uh, rose, it, uh, the waves would cut in a little bit and then it would rise some more and it would start again. So literally we have like five or six terraces just in Laguna and San Clemente, uh, Newport Coast and Palos Verdes, where you see these beautiful terraces that are very, very cleanly defined and you can drive along PCH and see that they're unchanging. And what's interesting is that when we uh, developed our suburban uh, uh, footprint in these cities, all the first neighborhoods were basically built along these terraces where they were already subdivided. They didn't have to do a lot of excavation work to build all these streets. So if you go into like Central Laguna and you just drive up, let's say Mountain Avenue, you can drive along these terraces and you can see where there's a disparate uh, platform as you uh, move up the hill. So this is very much um, the most interesting feature. Uh, they did uh, some age analysis of San Onofre above the um, uh, reactor 
At the very top, they estimated that the rock was 760,000 years old. At the very base, at the shoreline, uh, it's 120,000 years old. So imagine that in a course of um, uh, uh, a little less than a million years, you have about three to 5,000 feet gain just here in Orange County. The other thing that you'll see in the actual bluffs is what's called uh, uh, turbidite deposits. Um, and uh, this is where you have very even layering of rock and sand in the cliffs. So what it tells us that there was periods of dryness and there was periods of wetness so you had a lot of cobbles and a lot of sand coming down. Then you had a very calm uh, submerged environment where it was just a loose beach sand. Uh, and all of this as it was put under pressure created these cliffs. And then the other thing that you're gonna see and I'm gonna point out to you is that almost all of the coves that are defined in Laguna Beach going up to Corona del Mar going down to uh, uh, San Clemente, we have these very well-defined volcanic dikes. And uh, these are tied, believe it or not, to a very unique situation that developed uh, 60 miles inland in uh, the city of Glendora where I grew up. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But when you go um, to any of the uh, beach parks in Laguna, what you'll see is at uh, low tide is these very defined volcanic dikes that basically run um, under the cliffs and they go out to sea in uh, a very measured and angled uh, manner. Because the rock is volcanic, it's much harder than sedimentary rock. And so it resists erosion, but you'll see these very clear lines um, uh, when you visit these places. The, once you know uh, what you're looking at, you'll see that they're, they're very linear. They go out to sea. There's uh, areas where the rocks are exposed, um, but they're all very, very uh, linear. And this is a result of volcanic rocks that basically came up through the sedimentary rocks and now through erosion are more resistant. If you go to the montage, you can see them um, were very, very exposed just in front of the montage. But what's quite interesting is that uh, you can see the base rock here, which is the volcanic rock. And then you can see the original sedimentary rock. And this is the continuation of that sedimentary rock here. So literally what's happening is that uh, water's come in through the ocean, it's gone through this pass, it's taken out all the sediment, it's created this beach here. It's exposed this volcanic dike system. And the, it makes for these really beautiful swimming coves right here in, in, uh, at the montage. And that you can literally go through the complete length of Laguna and see these row after row. And it's the same rock at the same elevation. Uh, here's Main Beach. What's very unique about the one that's there is it actually kind of goes in dog le uh, legs uh, left. So you'll see that there's the bench and the terrace of the volcanic rock. You can see where it's exposed. And then you can kind of see these seamounts that are off here. And then you can see some of the dike systems that are right adjacent to it. So you can walk down and see these and they, they have a very different, um, uh, texture, and you can see that um, uh, they're very much of an uh, igneous nature. The, probably the most important uh, implication that you have in the coastal zone is that there's no gemstones to be found in Orange County. There's really been, never been any that have been reported of note, and that's just because of the nature of the geology. But what we do have which is the most important thing geologically is that along the fault system, and in particular the, the Inglewood to Newport, is that we have tremendous amount of oil that's come up in that fault zone. And just to give you um, uh, some numbers, Huntington Beach alone has produced 1 billion 
uh, barrels of oil by the year 2000. And they estimate that the reserves remaining is a minimum of 370 million still yet to come out of the fault system. So, uh, and this is not when um, uh, production was at its peak. Um, it was started in 1920s. Um, the actual annualized production peaked in 1972. And now we're kind of on a, a decay curve, but it's still producing massive amounts of oil. And you can see the um, kettle domes, which are very important. That's the Baldwin Hills, the Dominguez Hills, Signal Hill, Landing Hill, and Bolsa Chica. Um, they all have active uh, wells that you can see when you're driving along. So this is all a result of uh, being on this Inglewood Newport Fault. If you go inland and you look at other oil producing areas, uh, we have oil that's produced offshore and that's a result of the Palos Verdes Fault. We have literally this oil zone that goes all the way into Hollywood. And then the other area of Orange County, which is a, a, a result of a, a fault system that runs for, through Elsinore and ends in Yorba Linda is the Tonner Canyon. Uh, oil uh, fields. So all three of these oil fields are a direct result of these tectonic plates and that their ability to go in along these zones and, and drill and, and pull the oil out of these sediments. Now we're going to go uh, to my favorite area, which is uh, the Mount Baldy area in the eastern San Gabriels. And uh, what's really interesting is that when you go up into the mountains in the canyon that, that comprises Mount Baldy, one of the things that you immediately see in the rock is that it's tilted at 45 degrees. So where you have normally uh, bands of sedimentary rock, everything in the canyon literally is jacked at least 45 degrees, if not 60. So when we talk about the San Gabriels and the fact that they're recent, not only are they recent, but they're really being brought up in a, in a very uh, robust way. So it's not like it's just slowly moving the rock up. It's literally breaking the rock, tilting it. Um, uh, we've had 10,000 feet documented uh, of uplifting, and they believe that on top of that, probably three to 4,000 feet have already eroded off the mountains. So while this thing has been rising, it also sloughs off a lot of material. When you're in, um, when you're in uh, the actual Baldy area, you're gonna go across some really amazing fault systems. To the very north end of the, through the city of Wrightwood is you have the San Andreas Fault. When you uh, go into the middle part of the canyon, which uh, comprises uh, Mount Baldy area, is the San Gabriel Fault that runs east to west and it literally goes for uh, tens of miles. Uh, just in an offset where they look at rocks to the south and rocks to the north, there's a rocks that have moved a total of 13 miles. So they've been split apart by the fault and dragged along and literally been spread out 13 miles. At the very top, you have a, a thrust fault at Mount Baldy Summit, which basically um, the top of the mountain is a granite. And uh, at the bottom is 9,000 feet of this Paloma schist, which was uh, created in the um, uh, subduction zone 100 million years ago. And then there's a lot of uh, evidence of volcanoes that were tied to the same dikes that you see down at our beaches. You had a, a major volcanic field in the city of Glendora. And then all throughout the Baldy area is numerous igneous, di igneous dikes that were created at the same time about 30 million years ago. And those are the dikes that brought the gold. So almost all the gold mining that we're gonna talk about was a direct result of this vol vol volcanic um, uh, action. And then at the base of the San Gabriels, you have the Cucamonga Sierra Madre Fault that runs east to west. 
we're going to take you to one of my favorite mines, which is the Zusa fluorite uh, uh, location. And then when you go up to the Punch Bowl in San Andreas and Wrightwood, our previous trip is where you find the road night. So all of these things are tied basically to these fault systems and all of the rock is under extreme pressure. So what kind of defines the San Gabriels, which is very unique, is that you have these deep linear canyons like Mount Baldy and uh, San Gabriel uh, River. Uh, uh, and you have, uh, uh, to the very east, you have Lytle Creek. So you have these very deep linear canyons that go north to south. Those are defined by their own faults. You have incredibly active landslides that are a result of literally having millions of earthquakes in these mountains. So the rock gets loosened and it falls down these steep areas. So there's rock slides throughout the entire um, Mount Baldy region. And they're still very, very active um, throughout the entire region. They've had as much as 4,000 uh, feet of debris go across the canyon historically. Um, the lapis that we're gonna talk about is actually was brought down through these slides as well. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later. And then what you have is this whole jumbo of rocks, uh, granitic rocks like nice quartzite. We actually have marble, where, which is associated with rubies. And then we have this rock called phyllite. So when you go and you look at all these rocks, you have all these metamorphic rocks that have been on the surface and you have all these different rocks that are being brought up continuously. Um, the oldest rocks that have ever been brought up are mantle rocks that are 1.7 billion years old. Those are up on the Angeles crest. So when we look at the fault system that kind of de defined Mount Baldy and brought it up is one called the Vincent Thrust. Uh, what's interesting, like I said, is that it's at 8,000 feet up on the mountain, but the rock below is at least 80 million years old. So even though the mountains are very, very young in terms of, of being only 10 million years old, the rock below it is very, very old. So this is an historic uh, photo of uh, San Antonio Canyon. And this was taken over a hundred and probably 20 years ago. And so before uh, humankind got up here, it was a very broad um, stream bed, which you can see to the right. And uh, when you traveled up there, it usually took three to four days to kind of reach even the Mount Baldy area. And so what you see is this really interesting uh, uh, geology where you have this massive peak that sits by itself. And then you have on either side of it, these uh, uplifted 45 degree blocks. And what you're seeing there is really an intersection between three faults. You're seeing on the right end of the canyon, all the way north to south, the San Antonio Creek Fault. In the middle part of it, which defines the, the south end of Mount Baldy, is you have the San and Gabriel Fault, and that runs through Baldy Village and Ice House Canyon and continues all the way almost to the Great Vine. So it goes through the entire middle part of the San Gabriels. And then at the very top of Mount Baldy, you had at 8,000 feet elevation, you have this huge thing called the Vincent Thrust. So where you see the arrow though, which is very important is because you have all this uplifting, almost all the gem deposits that we know about are at the very top of the uh, 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 San Antonio Creek Fault. So the lapis and the rubies we're gonna talk about are found at this location where you see the arrow and um, they were formed at six to 8,000 feet above uh, the, the canyon floor. So as you go into the canyon, what's very interesting is that you see a lot of really unique geological features. So when you're at the very beginning is that, uh, of course, we have a thing called the Cucamonga Fault. What sits on the Cucamonga Fault? 
is the San Antonio Dam. Why wouldn't you put the, a major dam right on top of a fault system? So you literally can see in the rock, you can see the zones where the, the fault is. Um, and you can see it very clearly in the rock and you can see all the rock around it is incredibly distressed and been metamorphized. And then as the mountains rose, you have this layer of sedimentary sand that was sloughed off the mountains as they were rapidly rising and kind of forms this uh, loose kind of sandy alluvial, alluvial uh, layer that's right above it. So it's really kind of unique in that you have like a hard rock uh, base rock, which is this granite that's just been pulverized. And then on top of it, you have more recent stuff that was kind of sloughed off the mountains. And then when you start looking at the sides of the canyons, what you start seeing is these humongous landslides that have been coming down for probably millions of years. So you can see here uh, where you have a massive landslide where the hillside broke loose and now uh, vegetation has kind of covered it. Um, but this is just right on the east end of the canyon. And as you go up the entire length of the canyon, you have these landslides on both sides of the canyon. Uh, where um, um, the hogback is, it's literally three to 5,000 feet of rock that started on the right side and literally landed as it gave way on the, the total uh, west side of the canyon. So um, the brown rock that you see here right by the arrow, um, some of that is actually deposited by itself on the west end. And um, so there's all these ancient slides and where the lapis was found is actually right to the right of the shoe. So all the lapis that we're gonna talk about was in a vein, but because you have all this active rock slides, all of it was deposited over 6,000 feet uh, uh, leading down to the actual creek. So it's very unique in the fact that you have a tremendous amount of float material as a result of these incredibly active slides that are still going on today. The chute that you see here is a recent one. It's probably maybe 50 to 100 years old. So a little bit of history about Mount Baldy um, is that it got its name um, by the original uh, Mexican landholders. And it was named after San Antonio de Padua of Italy. And uh, the canyon itself, uh, they know um, that there was historically a, a band of Serrano Indians called the Tongva that uh, seasonally would come up and live in the canyon. Uh, one of the problems that you have in the chaparral community back in the day is it hosted a lot of grizzly bears. Uh, and so they were incredibly feared uh, by the local Indians. And when the Spaniards first came to uh, uh, Southern California, they had a, uh, uh, a group that visited in 1774. The thing they wrote about Mount Baldy is that there's too many grizzly bears there. So they didn't even venture into the canyon. They were so scared. So um, what uh, sadly happened was is that um, because they didn't integrate well with humans, uh, they were targeted for extermination. And the last one actually in the San Gabriels was shot in 1894. So literally in a course of 120 years, we wiped out uh, the bear flag symbol. We did not have black bears in the local mountains. Those were brought in 1930 during the depression. They took some uh, garbage uh, bears out of Yosemite and brought them down. And so we actually have about 150 uh, bears now in the San Gabriels. None of those are actually natural or native. So the only bears that we had in the LA basin were these grizzly bears. In the 1800s, we had our first cattle ranches and uh, they were built along the creek systems. And in 1839, uh, uh, Rancho Cucamonga 
uh, was basically the first land grant that actually took on San Antonio Creek. And then about 20 years later, where Mount Baldy lies, uh, just to the north is a place called Ice House Canyon. They actually mined ice from the snow during the winter, put it into uh, 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 blocks. It was uh, in a granite house there. And then they would use a meal trade to bring it into the city of Los Angeles. So that was a very exciting thing is that they would make these amazing ice creams and ices from snow that was up in Mount Baldy. And um, because we know that they had this uh, uh, route via mill train up to Ice House Canyon, and we're gonna talk about the lapis, that it was probably around this time in the 1850s as people were traveling to and from that they discovered that there was lapis in the creek. So the mines that we're gonna talk about around the lapis they estimate that they were uh, started mining for the lapis there as, as early as 1850. So you had a little bit of foot traffic that was uh, going up there. But again, it wasn't a, a place that was very hospitable to early campers and, and uh, early um, uh, uh, indigenous people because of these bears. Um, the photo that I showed you was probably shot in around um, 1890. Um, there was some development that happened um, up in the canyon in uh, the latter part of the 1900s to 2000. So there were some cabins that were built and it was a three day trip. Um, you would take the red car out and then you would get on a mule train and go up to your cabin was usually a two to three day journey into the Mount Baldy village area. And then if you uh, went to the actual summit, uh, that was done through a mule trail, which you see to the right. This is a group of miners that were going uh, up to a series of mining districts that were created at the very top. So these are all kind of historical photos from the 1800s. So there was a human history involving tourism. There was definitely a history involving uh, ice making. There was definitely a, a, a history of mining for uh, in the mid uh, 1800s. Um, because you have this thrust fault, um, it, uh, it raised a lot of prehistoric stream beds up uh, as it um, uplifted the Mount Baldy area. And in these channels were deposits of, of uh, gold bearing gravel. And so it's, this is probably the most unusual thing that at the very top of the mountain at 9,000 feet, because that's where the fault was, is where they actually found the gold. And so in 1870, uh, they discovered that there was gold at the very top. Uh, by 1878, they organized a mining district um, up in Mount Baldy. Uh, they started to mine this old river channel, uh, which is right at the top of the ski lift. And they basically uh, granted um, rights to three companies that owned basically 1,500 feet of ground along this uh, ancient gravel bed. And the amount of gold that was produced per day, um, they did a survey of six men and they made about $8 uh, a day um, by hand. And again, because of the snow uh, situation there, they really only could uh, 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 mine between May and November. So when we talk about gold mining, it wasn't a very uh, lucrative business. Uh, in mass, but if you were a miner, making $8 a day back in uh, 1800s was a lot of money, you know? So that's why people um, uh, uh, started. And, and there was at one time, a hundred men that were up on the top of the mountain uh, working these claims. In 1895, uh, they did, brought in what was called hydraulic mining, where they built a reservoir, had a pipe that led to a nozzle, and they started 
blowing out the sides of the notch at the very top, uh, thinking that this would be where the gold was. What happened is that it so muddied the stream that all the ranchers and fruit growers down in the valley basically um, went to lynch them. <laughs> so there's a very documented story of, of uh, uh, bands of farmers going up and confronting the miners. It went into a series of court uh, cases. And by 1893, the courts basically ruled that they couldn't do hydraulic mining anymore uh, in the uh, San Gabriel Mountains in that area. And the only time that mining has ever resumed was during the Great Depression. They tried to do dry wash mining, dry mining. So the, the history of gold mining up in the San Gabriels, it ran for about 25 years. Um, gold is still there. Um, gold uh, was taken out. And what's great is that all the mining uh, equipment and the mining history is still visible. And so when you go up there, uh, where the ski lift is, just to the right of the, the lodge, which is at the very top of the thing, was the area where the miners were. So up into the 1940s, you could have seen all of these cabins where they lived. So th there was a, quite a settlement uh, right up in the, in the trees and they called this Miner's Bowl. And so these photos that you see here were taken in 1895. Uh, here's the actual um, uh, hydraulic mine. So this was from 1894 to 1895. Here you can see a, a crew of men where they're blasting into the hillside. And then they have all of these uh, 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 flumes and, and uh, traps to basically uh, capture the gold as it's coming out of the, the hillside. The other thing that uh, we had is that we actually had um, a mine. It's gone by three different names. It goes by the Gold Ridge Mine, the uh, Agamemnon, or the Old English. And that's directly uh, to the uh, north of the base of the, the ski mountain, right above San Antonio Falls. And so this was a vein of very rich uh, 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 gold bearing tied to these volcanic um, uh, dikes. So this was um, founded in um, uh, 1897, right about the time that the hydraulic mines were told to close. So we had over a hundred miners that basically uh, started to work this part of the mountain. And there are still in place uh, buildings and a mill at, at this mine site. Uh, the total vein uh, went 110 feet underground. And then in 1907, there was a very deep snowfall and it kind of took out the residents. Uh, but what's still on the site there is the actual mill where they uh, would grind the, the gold veins down uh, and make them into powder. So when you uh, go up to Mount Baldy, just around the ski area and the ski lift, you can find the original pipe that was part of the uh, hydraulic mining. It's still, the uh, section of the pipe still runs from the reservoir. Um, you can still find the, the, the uh, mill equipment still on site at the uh, Gold Ridge mine. So there it's all exists and is available to the public to see. When we talk about gemstones though, what's quite interesting is that there's many that are in uh, the Mount Baldy area. Uh, the first and most famous one is the uh, Mount Baldy Lapis. So I pointed out on the arrow where that's found, it's found in the middle part of the canyon. But uh, the deposit has been known for at least 160 years. And what's interesting is that there was a natural history of gems and decorative stones written by a gentleman by the name of C.W. King in 1867. And he basically identified uh, 
the rock as saying that it was beautiful, but it had too much pyrite and too much white material. And so you see these two stones here. These are stones that I mined in 1980. Uh, I knew about the mine. I went up and started collecting uh, vigorously in the spring times. And um, so this material has been known um, and documented so at least 1867. And given the fact that it was published probably means that the mining actually probably started around 1857 uh, uh, at least. So because it was known that it was a, a big producer. And what's quite interesting is as part of this metamorphic is that the host rock where this uh, lapis was found um, is associated with marbles. Uh, we had uh, Patrick um, Keegan came and talked four years ago. And uh, this is uh, a piece of lapis float that he found in the creek. So this uh, came from the original uh, 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 vein and it tumbled down the mountain over the years. And probably in a course of tens of thousands of years, became this uh, rounded boulder. So you actually can find the lapis from the base creek all the way up to the, the actual mine site. Uh, the mine was uh, rediscovered by a gentleman by the name of Gordon Sir in 1913. And he indicated that it was already pretty much worked out, that it went 15 feet deep at the source. And in, um, in uh, about 20 years ago, the Forest Service was really concerned with this 15 foot uh, overhang. So uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people, they went in with dynamite uh, and uh, using a detrent. My geologist oversaw this and they literally blew the ledge down. So I've heard a lot of people report that there was a, a giant landslide that took out the, the mine. The reality was is the forest surface was really concerned that somebody would continue to mine that deposit and that it was not safe. So they actually detonated dynamite and took out the, the hazard. As I told you, uh, gold was discovered in 1870 at Baldy Notch. In 1895, all uh, gold and hydraulic mining was banned. Um, uh, because uh, Cascade Canyon had water and it ran off uh, to the side of the main creek in 1929, they made uh, it um, uh, present that there could be no mining in the Cascade Canyon. So basically in 1937, a guy went in and he did an analysis of the site. They found calcite, pyrite, uh, 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 zeolite. And um, so there's a lot of things that are understood about the geology of it, but what's unique about the deposit itself is it's at six to 8,000 feet. And again, there's a tremendous amount of float material that came down. There's really nothing left of the main deposit. It's all been, been uh, uh, worked. What's adjacent though, which a lot of people do not know, is that there's amazing rubies that are uh, uh, right adjacent to the lapis. And they come in um, uh, a very pretty shade of red. Uh, they come in uh, pink, they come in a, a cinnamon brown. Uh, and like any ruby, um, they have chromium and iron in them. And when you put them under a black light, you have this amazing uh, fluorescence. And I say it to you, it is the deepest red, ruby red, when you see it under a black light. Um, the crystals are usually about an inch uh, long. Um, you see within the crystals, you see graphite and rutile uh, that kind of clouds them. So they're not particularly clear, um, but they are very well defined. Um, the, they're found in these uh, landslide deposits on the east end of San Antonio. So there's, um, there's many of these are adjacent to where the lapis was. Um, they were probably formed below that. Under the black light, you see a yellow green stone from time to time, a crystal that's a, a dravite tourmaline, which is a yellow green tourmaline. Uh, so you see these. 
And again, because none of these stones were ever uh, facet quality, uh, these rubies were never commercially mined, but they've always been there. And a lot of people will come up in and collect specimens. If you go onto the backside of Mount Baldy, um, there's an area called Heath Canyon. And what you see there is you find this incredibly beautiful stone. It's almost like pink jade. It's called rhodonite. And that's found in um, the Paloma Schist. And um, there's numerous veins of this at the very top of this uh, right wood, about two to 3,000 feet above the town. And uh, the main claim were, um, uh, was dynamited by a mine owner in the 1970s because he was afraid that people would high grade his claim. So he thought, well, if I can't keep it all, then I'm just gonna blow it all to smithereens. So a lot of this float material that you find in the canyon was a result of him basically blasting the rock and the, the rhodonite going everywhere into the canyon. But uh, above it are still deposits of the, the vein structure that holds this uh, rhodonite. It's a very uh, breathtaking uh, hike. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart, but there is some really beautiful yellow and pink rhodonite still to be found up in the, this part of the San Gabriels. This is the north end of Mount Baldy. So we talked about these volcanic dikes. We talked about these fossils, these, this pot of wells that got part of this um, volcanic eruption. And what we found out was, is that when we started putting pieces together, that uh, we realized that there was a major volcanic episode about 30 million years ago. And, um, and that these uh, volcano fields basically incorporate the towns of Azusa, Glendora, Laverne, Pomona, and San Dimas. And so you have literally a volcanic field that runs for about eight miles of deposits. And then the same volcanics that you see down at the beach and the same volcanics that you see up in Baldy were tied to these episodes. So we think that these vol vol volcanic uh, uh, rocks were basically created uh, at least 30 million years ago to present. The other thing which is quite interesting is that they think that the original volcano field was actually around the location of the Salton Sea. And as the San Andreas moved, they were kind of dragged up to Glendora Laverne. And then they say that they were probably, as the mountains rose, they were separated by six to eight miles and moved in another direction. So the rocks are very, very old. Personally, and I say this too, I've spent a lot of time looking at the different deposits there. The most beautiful agate I've ever seen in the world is found in seams uh, in Glendora. It's a secret location that I've never really talked about, but it's, it rivals the best Montana agate. So it's shot full of, of silica and marcasite. And these are the old vent systems that were part of the volcano. And the fluorite that we're gonna talk about, this is in the very West volcanic field. So this whole area, if you're from Glendora uh, and you're driving up to 57 freeway, uh, there's the Diamond Bar, the north end in Pomona, which is called Elephant Hill. Uh, there's South Hills. There's the area that uh, runs from San Dimas Canyon up through uh, Bluebird Canyon. And then all the base of Glendora is all these old volcanic fields. So these things have been very well uh, defined geologically. They were thought that they were started to be created 30 million years ago. And then somehow about 8 million years ago, these things got sheared off. So they thought that these things right here that you see here um, were all together. And what's happened now is they're breaking apart. And they've actually moved between 6 to 12 miles uh, uh, distance. So as the fault kind of dragged these things along and you had all this seismic activity, um, they were, these things basically kind of broke apart. 
But the agates that if you want to know about it, uh, they're all found right around the area of Glendora Country Club. So there's a tremendous amount of veins. And that's all I'm going to share with you. That's my honor system. Um, if you look at kind of the western end of the vol volcanoes uh, in the, on the border of Azusa, so you had a very famous mine called the Felix Fluorite Mine. And this was discovered in 1892. And so what you have adjacent to the volcanics is a decomposed granite um, that was brought up. And within it, you had galena and calicopyrite um, and fluorite that basically was plumbed in through these veins. So the, the mine started in 1892, pretty much by the 1950s, they stopped um, uh, mining it, but there was beautiful crystal structures uh, that, uh, that were pulled out. Um, and so very classic green fluorite. What they would use this for is they would grind it up and it's used as an industrial glaze for uh, glass and enamels. And the other thing that it's used for is to remove sulfur from uh, molten metal. So the flux is added to uh, steel and it takes out the sulfur impurities. So you can still go up um, uh, to the mine. Um, it's a very uh, arduous uh, uh, way to get to it, but you can still find these really beautiful thumbnail crystals. Um, and if you are so inclined and you're lazy, I can tell you that Walt Lombardo at Nevada Book and Minerals uh, has so many uh, historic uh, specimens that were collected in the 50s and 60s. Um, I, I have my own collection uh, that I pulled out of the mine when I was very young in 1973. So I can attest that there's a lot of material still um, that was never mined. Um, and this is the actual mine today that you can see here is that here's the faces where it was mined. It sits on a, a, a hillside uh, right adjacent to the water district of Azusa. And uh, this is taken from a park right there. Um, I cannot uh, advise you to jump a fence, but if you want to do collecting, you probably have to get creative and say that you didn't know there was a fence there, but you can really walk right up to the, the mine. So anyway, um, to uh, end this conversation, you know, you, you have an incredibly rich geological history here in Orange County. You have an incredibly rich um, history up in the San Gabriel Mountains. What's great about all of this is it's literally a 45 minute to an hour drive. All of these things can be seen from a car. Um, and um, just a very unique and complex uh, mountain range, which is my favorite. You know, I, is, again, I've been doing trips up here since 1976. So with that said, um, I'm just gonna open it up to uh, any questions. Uh, if not, then I would love to say goodbye. We're gonna do a field trip maybe in May um, that will recreate many of these places that you saw today. Anybody have any questions? Richard? Yes. Did, can you hear me? Oh. Yes, I can. Did you ever run into anybody with a shotgun there ready to ch chase you out? No. So you, you just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. So I've... Uh, there's, the mine has been abandoned since 1950, um, but it is in a, it's in an area adjacent to what was the former Monrovia nursery. And uh, it's part of a, a fire road system that runs along the base of it. So you have to be familiar with how those fire roads are cut into the hillside and how to access them. Oh, wow. <laughs> Because I know my dad took me up there when I was a kid. Um, what area? I don't know. But it was by a dam somewhere. And I know we went whacking at rocks. I didn't really know what I was up to or doing. But I said, I like rocks, dad. So he says, oh, let's go here. 
Yeah, so I, I was there. I, I pulled some really nice specimens, which I have, and I think I was probably 14 years old. So and just taken with a rock hammer out of uh, veins of fluorite that run through the granite. Any other questions? Found any gold up there? Uh, yes, you can find gold at the uh, uh, East Fork of the San Gabriels. You can find that via panning. Uh, you should be able to find um, gold still in um, uh, Notch Gulch, um, which is right below where they were doing the hydraulic mining. So gold can still be found there. Did you see the question from Tara, Tara Shavit? She's asking if you can still mine ruby and lapis. And uh, what's the other one there, Tara? I didn't, that was on the chat. Yeah, so, so anybody can go um, in a non-commercial sense and take lapis or rubies from the east side of the uh, canyons. Like a hobbyist, you know, you can yeah. do that. Yeah, uh, all commercial mining has been banned. Any other questions? If not, then we can wrap this up and we can certainly thank Richard for a, a very wonderful presentation of, of all of a sudden finding out what we didn't know what we have. I've seen those those shot jaws with the teeth, you know, and the shark things over there and by Alicia and uh, La Paz, you know, in the in the, in the shopping you know, sections yeah. there. Uh, and all of a sudden you're walking along and here's here's Jaws looking at you. Yes. And and that it came from here and is just, it's it's amazing. It's yep. amazing. You know, what's, they were really, there first. What's, what's really wonderful, Richard, is that you paint such a very vivid picture of everything. Yes. Very, very well done there. Well, anyway, I'm going to say goodbye and I'm going to have dinner. Uh, but anyway... Very nice uh, to give this presentation as always to this group. And um, I'll just say goodbye. Thank, Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, to everybody. Bye bye. Thank you for calling. Coming. <laughs> what, Ellen? Lovely picture, Ellen. Cleared off. About. Um, Did what? Oh, Hi, Gary. How's Sheila? She's right here.